Hey everybody, I'm Jason. This is Supply Demand Daily. I keep tabs on the economy so you don't have to. I over my hand there for a second. Uh, happy Monday, June 20th, 2022. I'm going to do a quick one today. I'm just going to give you an update on the twin crises in the nation of Germany in both inflation and energy. So there's a really bad energy situation a Bruin in Germany right now. The entirety of Western Europe has been having extreme difficulties uh, sourcing enough energy inputs in order to meet its demand. This started back in the fall of 2021, expanded from China and probably Greater East Asia, though I don't know that for a fact, which began in May of 2021. So the world has been strapped for energy for about a year now, and the situation seems to only be getting worse. But the inspiration for this is that we got data out of Germany from their statistics, uh, from their government statistics service, let's call it. I don't know exactly what the terminology is in German or how it translates to English. We got ter- but we got data out of there saying that producer prices had increased in the country by 33% year over year. And so I decided to go into that data to see if this was, you know, sort of a base effects thing or kind of a freak of the statistics, that kind of deal. And so I'm going to go ahead and show you that information. Oh, shoot. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, it's already behind me. So I'm, I'm used to clicking around and, and that kind of stuff. But you know, I'll just keep it going, whatever. Um, so here we are, I'm showing a chart here of producer prices, as well as consumer prices in Germany going back to 1991. This is the annual percentage increase in consumer and producer prices, which is the most commonly quoted what we call headline inflation rate. And I'm gonna break this data in a couple of different forms here in a minute. But I figured we would go ahead and start here in order to motivate the discussion. So the reason that I wanted to point this out is because, as you can see, this blue line, which is the rate of change in the producer price index, so you can call that the producer price inflation rate if you want to. Um, and by the way, these numbers on the left axis here, those are all percentage levels of change. So we got 25, that means 25% in whichever, you know, time frame this is. So we're looking at producer prices all the way up here at 33% year on year. So that means that between May of 2021, because these are lagged by a month, between May of 2021 and May of 2022, producer prices, the ones measured by the statistical agencies in Germany, they went up 33 gosh dang percent. Holy crap, that is insane. It dwarfs the consumer price index. As you can see, these two usually do a pretty good job of tracking each other or at least staying in the same range. When one goes down, the other one kind of goes down. When one goes up, the other one kind of goes up. You can obviously see there's more stability in the orange line. Again, that is the rate of change in consumer prices. Okay. And just a little, I mean, what are producer prices? Let's talk about that here for a second. What are producer prices in the first place? Imagine that I run a company and I keep using, you know, things right in front of me as an example. So imagine that you run a company that sells microphones. So what's going to happen when it comes to recording these two pieces of data? is that the manufacturer of the microphones or even an intermediate input to the microphones, like maybe this mesh thing that covers the uh, whatever's in there that captures the sound. I don't know how electronics work, Um, but they're going to be surveyed and they're going to report the increase in the prices that they receive for these goods. So that's the producer price index. It's, It's the it's the price that producers actually receive for the stuff that they make. And you might think that, uh, wait a minute, if we're reporting um, with, if we're reporting what producers are receiving and what consumers are paying, shouldn't that be about the same thing? And the reason that they're not the same, right? So the consumer price index is what consumers pay for the goods. So let's say that I bought, that I bought this thing at Best Buy. Well, this would be whatever the company that manufactures Blue Yeti microphones. I'm not, I don't have any ad deal with them, unfortunately, but um, this would be whatever the company that manufactures Blue Yeti microphones received from whoever bought it from them in order to sell it in the store. And then the consumer price 
price index would be whatever I paid for the Blue Yeti microphone. That's how that works. And the reason that they're not the same is because you go through some intermediate steps to get from producer to consumer. The maker of the Blue Yeti microphone doesn't sell it directly to me. They sell it to a wholesale distributor who has customers like Walmart, like Target, like Best Buy, and then they sell it to me. So there's a layering there that happens within the production to the retail chain where it's ultimately distributed to consumers. And that production process, you know, that that process of getting it from production to retail actually shaves off some of the volatility in pricing. So that's how that that's how that works. So I'm showing we have consumer prices in Germany of about seven percent, seven seven and a half, I think was the most recent reading, and we have producer prices in Germany that are all the way up to thirty three. I mean, holy crap, it's just insane. Now, is this a matter of um, statistical gimmicks? Is this a matter of base effects? Um, you know, when whatever was happening last year has a has a really big effect on the on the headline numbers for this year. Uh, unfortunately, no. Unfortunately, no. It's not that at all. In fact, the most recent figures, as far as producer price index inflation goes, um, so what I'm showing here, just to explain again what this chart is, it's a little bit different. In the blue bars, what I'm showing is the year-over-year -year producer price index inflation rate. Uh, so taking the, the prices of things in May 2021, subtracting them from the prices of things in May 2022, and finding the percentage change. That's what that is. And then this three-month line is what I call three-month annualized. And what that is is saying, imagine if the last month-to-month -month changes of the last three months happened for an entire year. What would that annual rate be? So what we're doing is we're eliminating base effects, essentially. That is the that is the goal. That is the, the good thing about three-month annualizing things or even maybe one-month annualizing things is you remove that base effect, that, uh, that effect that can happen when, when data was doing one thing last year and it's not doing that thing anymore, but it manipulates the statistics to look either better or worse than they actually are. All right, so... That's the use value between three month annualized and um, on a three month annualized basis, the rate of inflation for producer prices actually picked up a little bit from April to May, as you can see with this little tick down here, whereas the month to or excuse me, the year to year stayed the same. So that means that the month to month uh, rate of change in prices, whatever fundamentals there are, you know, we have excess demand, we have uh, obviously war of U war in Ukraine and the energy situation that we're going to talk about. Those are happening very actively. Those aren't, we're not just looking at things that happened last year or, um, or that happened maybe a few months ago. This is current. This is now, um, at least as of May of 2022, because we don't have numbers for June and we're halfway through June, but whatever. Uh, this is as close to now as we can possibly get. Um, so this is no, um, this is definitely not a not a base effects thing, not something that could be blamed on a statistical fluke. This is what's happening in the here and now, at least as far as the most current data that we have is concerned. So with that, I'm going to move on to some crazy details that I read on a uh, on a news site that I don't, I don't usually get on, but these are direct quotes. So I figure it's um, it, I mean, the stories that come out of it's from remix news and the stories that come out are usually pretty accurate, um, especially if it's just some some synopsis of an interview with a with an actual um, government official and that's what that is so this is from an interview with the head of the uh, of one of the economic agencies one of the ener energy regulators for Germany and just to go ahead and share this information with you I'm gonna I'm just gonna read these excerpts of the article so if you don't feel like reading sit back and relax and you don't have to so a gas shortage and high prices will send quote shock waves throughout the country, leading to landlords cutting the heat for tenants and widespread company bankruptcies, warned Klaus Mueller, the head of Germany's Federal Network Agency, which is the regulatory office for electricity, gas, telecommunications, postal services, and railway markets. That is a really big job. That's a lot of stuff to handle. But uh, Mueller paints a bleak picture about the crisis in an interview with German newspaper uh, Rheinische uh, Post saying that it will send shockwaves throughout the country, banks will ramp up their business with installment loans, and ailing companies will fall into insolvency. 
Uh, and here's another quote. Tenancy law stipulates that the landlord, this is, I think, the most interesting part, but tenancy law stipulates that the landlord must adjust the heating system during the heating period so that the minimum temperature falls between 22 and 22, or 20 and 22 degrees Celsius. The government could temporarily lower the heating requirements for landlords. We're discussing this with politicians. So they have a regulation that says that, you know, the in most cases, the landlord is going to be in charge of the, the amount of electricity that you get to your apartment in order to heat it. And that landlord has to maintain a minimum temperature of X, especially during the winter. So this is a law that's on their books. And this is looking so bad as far as energy scarcity and coming shortages that the government is looking at actually dropping that heating requirement. So I, I hope the German, this is extremely unfortunate. And, un, and unfortunately, it's a, um, it is a result of misguided policy more than anything else. Um, you know, if you just look at the, the last 20 years of energy policy in Germany, which is more than I have time to go into, de into today, but uh, this is extremely unfortunate, and I hope that um, I, I do hope that there's some solution that ends up happening, or uh, that maybe they'll be able to make up the gap with coal. So uh, Germany has been, in a way, uh, through their through their UN channels, through the through the international diplomatic channel, kind of lecturing um, other world leaders throughout the last several years about not doing enough on climate change. And and often, you know, if you just scroll through political social media, you'll see at least up until 2022, you see, oh, well, Germany is doing this and they have X amount of their power that comes from windmills and solar. And the uh, people in Norway, they have all of this energy that comes from um seas of well literally seas a uh, windmill wind turbine um wind turbine farms that are that are seaborne that are out on the ocean and all of these different things well uh that's not going to be enough to get them through the winter and that is not a that is not a theory or anything it's just evident by the actions of these different governments that are actually uh firing up coal plants instructing their energy industry to fire up coal plants in order to stave off the energy crisis uh, because they know uh, forecasts are looking like they're not going to be able to get enough natural gas in order to heat everybody's homes and carry out the manufacturing demands on these countries, you know, the business demands. And so they're having to refire up coal plants. Um, and part of that for Germany, especially, is that they have denuclearized considerably over the last 20 years. Um, th there's a quote here, energy emergency move is bitter but essential to ease the threat of the energy shortage economic minister robert habeck says that's from the ft today an article that i would have read but i don't uh, i subscribe to bloomberg i'm not subscribed to ft and that is a um that is a news source with a paywall so sorry about that uh, netherlands and austria are doing the same thing they are also rebooting coal plants in order to get through this winter and we know that it is uh, some portion the war itself but also the political response response to the war of doing sanctions and moving to ban certain types of energy from their uh, new arch nemesis Russia in order to make that happen. So uh, the last thing that I want to turn to that I mentioned in the um, in the cover story there is that there's been a bit of a, um, you might say, Trumpian irony to this whole thing. So a video surfaced on Twitter with all of this stuff currently going on in the German energy market, a video resurfaced on Twitter of a speech of President Donald Trump uh, kind of lecturing Europe and especially Germany on energy independence in uh, 2018. And this was captioned and, and, and now this news added a bunch of lovely music to it. And uh, it's just, I, I think you should, I think you should get a look because it's all very, um, it's interesting in the context of what's going on now to see what was said and how these, uh, and how the German delegation reacted, which is what now this news was celebrating at the time. They were just, they were in, they were, joying in the laughter of the German delegation here, the German delegates to the UN about how they really took it well and had the correct response to what Trump was saying. So now I'll just shut up and play it. Germany will become totally dependent on Russian energy if it does not immediately change course. I love the music they have in the background, by the way. It's great. Highly misleading, says CNBC. 
here in the fraction. Western Hemisphere, we are committed to maintaining our independence from the encroachment of expansionist foreign powers. So all of that is just to say, um, for the record, I'm not a um, not a Republican. I actually voted for Bernie Sanders in the 2016 primary, which if I had it to do over again, let's be honest, I wouldn't have. But and then I voted for Hillary Clinton in the 2016 general, and I haven't voted since 2018 because it's dumb. So or that's my personal view. If you want to go, if you want to vote, go ahead and vote. I'm just here for economics. So um, yeah, somebody as somebody who's never been a Trump fan, I just think it's interesting because he was pointing out something that's really that tends to be an important part of nat- national security. It's why the United States has a strategic petroleum reserve, and also uh, I believe Europe has one too, and China definitely has one. Uh, they also have strategic reserves of all sorts of other commodities, including food commodities and uh, copper and steel, I believe, aluminum, those kinds of things. So um, just goes to show that energy security and national security in certain circumstances tend to go hand in hand. And um, whenever those circumstances arrive, finding out that you ignored your energy security for too long is a really, really bitter thing to experience. And I do hope that German policymakers will uh, will be a little bit smarter about this and how they handle it and maybe drop the the import bans altogether. That's what they should do, but who knows if they will. This has been Supply and Demand Daily. I hope you'll join me tomorrow for some more economic data and commentary. Let me know in the comments if there, if if you uh, have any feedback as to how I can improve these videos, and shoot me a like and a subscribe on YouTube. That'd be cool. I'm also on Rumble, and I'm also on Truth Social. I just got on those yesterday, and uh, we'll see, see how that goes. So I hope you enjoy the rest of your June 20th, and uh, I'll see you I'll see you later. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Have a good one. Thanks.